back to Gladiator for Europe. I'm Liam, here with Flush and Sam. Hello. And Sam B. Hello. And we are here for the start of a really fun new series we're doing, The World Between the Wars, looking at the genuinely global changes that transformed our politics from 1919 and 1939, and in many ways gave us the modern world we live in today. The ambitions, decisions, and blunders of peoples and movements during this era would have incredibly far-reaching impacts. It's also a period filled with incredibly fun, sometimes even farcical characters, alongside really some of the most repulsive figures in human history. This is a period that a lot of us are really interested in. It's a period that might seem very relevant in some ways. And it's also a period that a lot of us really like learning about and talking about. There's so much we can work with in the interwar period that we thought it would only be natural to do a whole podcast series on this 20-year span. Yeah, and it's also an interesting historical moment in that uh, we, as in the listeners of this podcast, it's likely that you are among the last uh, people who are going to have any kind of link to this period, the reminiscences of grandparents and things of that nature. So, So in some ways, we might personally have some idea of what this world was, even if we didn't directly experience it. Yeah, this is the last time you have people who are actually from that era that you can talk to. Exactly. Everybody listening here, your grandparents were most likely alive, or at the very least, your great-grandparents were around when many of the these events were happening. You know, if you live in somewhere like Russia or France, there's a really good chance that you lost many of your relatives in this period. If you happen to be Jewish in had relatives in Europe, there's a very good chance that the events of this period brought profound tragedy and violence and murder to your family's lives. One more thing about this period that's especially interesting for podcast form is that this is one of the first moments in world history where everything was caught on tape. We have footage of a lot of the events we're going to be talking about. Radio broadcasts from across the 20s and 30s and even film newsreels captured these events as they were happening. I feel like this gives you a much more visceral and personal connection to what the world looked like in this era that makes it much more intimately relatable today. In this episode, we're going to be looking more at trends rather than specifics, which we're going to cover more in depth in the coming episodes. Yeah, and so if this series is going to be about the interwar period, obviously it's going to start and end with world wars. So I think the best way to get started is to talk about what did the world look like during and immediately after World War I. World War I, uh, the less fun of the two wars, I'd have to say, because it was obviously surpassed by the sequel. Um, not, not as many diehard World War I heads out there. Yeah, but nevertheless, we do know something about it. If you went to an American public school, there's a good chance that you know that the outbreak of the war happened in 1914 because there was an arcane system of diplomacy in Europe, which sooner or later was bound to come apart. And you probably know it had something to do with the downfall of a lot of monarchies. And if you're especially, uh, if you really paid attention, you might know that this is also how we got a lot of songs like... You're a grand old flag, and how we got the uh, I want you Uncle Sam poster, and maybe also the reason why uh, your German American great grandpa changed his name from Bernhardt to Brown. And in Britain, the House of Saxe Coburg and Goethe became the House of Windsor. And also that time when everyone started calling Germans the Hunt for some reason. If you want to look a little more closely, Europe in the 19th century, coming off the Napoleonic Wars, saw Britain emerge as the primary economic power pretty much worldwide, with France as a distant second in Europe. As the various German states began to industrialize and move toward unification, Britain started worrying that maybe a new German state might be able to surpass them economically. France, meanwhile, had a lot of maybe much more pressing concerns about a powerful German nation right on their borders. In 1871, the French fears were proved correct when Prussia, the most powerful German state at this time, went to war with France, conquered a couple major French provinces, and transformed into the German Empire, which was immediately the foremost military power on the European continent. In the 40 years after the 1871 war, you saw mounting tensions as all forces of Europe sought to compete economically 
and on the battlefield with each other, basically in preparation of a general war that would determine the fate of Europe. The German unifier himself, Bismarck, once predicted that one day the Great European War will come out of some damn silly thing in the Balkans. Uh, That was in 1888. And he was certainly correct. So after those uh, aforementioned events in the Balkans, Germany's ally Austria would end up going to war against France's ally Russia. And these alliance networks turned this conflict between two really secondary powers into a massive war involving every major country in Europe. So that's the more diplomatic history uh, point of view of the way that this all developed. You also have a competing narrative, uh, the Leninist one, uh, which he put out most clearly in his 1917 pamphlet, Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism. Yeah, classic banger. He basically argued that the war was the result of imperialist competition for the colonies, uh, which they needed as a market to dump surplus goods and finance capital to keep their domestic economies afloat. Yeah, which is kind of interesting because he didn't he didn't really see places like India as simply being, you know, places where natural resources were extracted. They also were markets and that the British were able to expand their manufacturing economy to India by basically creating a captive audience that they would sell products to. Yeah, and whose own domestic markets would have to be destroyed, such as the famous case in in Bengal in the 18th century, where the British East India Company was literally going around and cutting the thumbs off uh, uh, off domestic uh, cloth uh, producers. Yeah, yeah, you know, um, and then decades before Lenin, doesn't Marx have that line about how a uh, a new loom in Britain could put hundreds of weavers out of work in China? Lenin talked about the partition and repartition of the world, and eventually that had to come to Europe itself. In a lot of ways, both the strategies and tactics of colonial maintenance were brought back to Europe, and a lot of the genuinely horrifying brutalities wrought upon non-European peoples were now being experienced at home. I mean, hell, that happened in the U.S. too, as well. I mean, our um, the American colonial campaigns in the Philippines are a really, really good example of... Connecting to, yeah, anti-insurgency policing in America's inner cities today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, now tell us, Russian Sam, who was Arno Meyer, and why is he important to this period we're talking about? So you have the diplomatic history version, uh, you have the Leninist version, and then you have this one version that I'm particularly uh, fond of, uh, which was coined by a historian, Arno Meyer, who's still alive, actually. He's like 95 years old. So in his work, Meyer has labeled the period from 1914 to 1945 as the 30 years crisis. So really a second 30 years war in Europe. Which to him was a period when there was an increasing disconnect between the landed aristocracy who wielded the levers of political power, even though they had financially and economically stagnated behind the bourgeoisie and the needs of the bourgeoisie and their proletariat. So from this perspective, uh, this period marked the completion of the bourgeois revolutions. What had started back in 1848 was finally completed in 1945. Right. So you could say that this 30 years crisis is the reason why landed aristocracy lost its final grip on genuine state power. Many of the old monarchies of Europe were completely abolished, and those that remained generally saw a slide toward constitutional monarchy or even social democracy. The monarchy of Sweden has a lot less power than it did 150 years ago, in no small part due to the changes of this 30-year period. So, as for the causes of the war, Meyer argued in the primacy of internal politics, as opposed to the diplomatic historian's idea that that external politics was the key driving force here. Uh, So, according to Meyer, uh, the situation in most European countries by 1914 was one of massive unrest and erosion of the political center. So basically, the onset of the war was an attempt to forestall domestic crises that could have easily spilled into civil wars, uh, which was to be managed by the rulers of these countries opting to go to international war to to prevent this eventuality. And, you know, we can make this more explicit. In, In many ways, the fear here is socialism and communism. Yeah, a proletarian revolution. Which had already existed as pretty substantial forces in Europe before the war, but what ironically only reach their greatest extent after World War I happens. Because such a big part of the interwar period, and why it's so fun for us to talk about, is that this is really when you see the initial ascension of communist parties in Europe and many other parts of the world. Of course, on the tragic flip side of that, the forces of reaction that coalesced to counter 
these workers' movements would become the social basis of the fascist movements, which would transform Europe in ways nobody could have imagined. Meyer argues that in the years leading up to World War I, even the most secure bourgeois parliamentary powers, you know, countries like Britain and France, were being really seriously challenged by new political movements, such as the socialists, and that in other countries, with less developed liberal traditions, places like Austria and Russia, any kind of efforts to build more, a more democratic society were seen as an, a threat to the entire ruling apparatus. And so as a way to resolve these internal tensions, the powers of Europe looked elsewhere, hoping to focus these kinds of energies into patriotism and aggressive nationalism instead. And Meyer continues by stating that the fear of revolution and organized labor uh, created a counter-revolutionary attitude among the old centers of power, both the people who drew the power and wealth from feudal relations, as well as the besieged petite bourgeoisie, which had more in common with its, you know, with its bourgeois cousins, but which was nevertheless threatened by uh, the development of more advanced industry. And so the political center in this formulation became reliant on the right, quote, as a backstop with the powerful encouragement of the upper echelons of the army, the foreign offices, the diplomatic corps, the ministry of the interior, and in most cases, the church. In a lot of ways, this would prefigure the rise of fascism to counter those movements. In 1914, the floodgates would open and the powers of Europe would meet in battlefields for what was essentially a mass suicidal endeavor. An enormous chunk of the European population and also the populations of countries like Turkey and Syria would lay dead in the battlefield. The outbreak of the Spanish flu near the end of the war would kill even more people, eventually leading to a post-war situation in which nearly everybody was to some extent touched by this massive and essentially needless outbreak of violence and despair. We should also mention it wasn't just Europe also. The massive number of colonial troops from India to French West Africa, everywhere else imaginable, who fought in the you know mud of Belgium, and that had a pretty powerful effect too in giving a lot of them. You see a lot of uh, independence movements kind of start bubbling after this. Yeah, and, and speaking of yeah, non-European areas, the Ottoman Empire, which was you know a belligerent in the war, ended up losing 15% of its population in former Ottoman territories due to the war and also famine, disease, and of course also genocide of Armenian and Greek-speaking populations in the aftermath of the war. Anatolia is always has always been very diverse, and it still is diverse today, but it was just completely ripped apart. I find it very interesting and uh, worth noting that the founder of Turkey, Ataturk, was born in what's now Greece. He was born in Salonika. Right. You had these major population transfers in the former Ottoman Empire as these ancient communities of Greek speakers in Turkey and Turkish speakers in the Balkans were pretty much destroyed. Many millions of people were forced to leave their homes during this period in an effort to create new homogeneous nation states. Oh, yeah. I mean, um, Garibaldi was born in what's now France. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's a story you see a lot as these national identities are formed and often use the medieval and ancient past to justify their existence. But in fact, the understanding of a nation state as a singular and homogeneous entity didn't really exist until this period when you saw mass ethnic cleansing of minorities back and forth across pretty much every border in Europe during this time. In Central Europe, you saw a situation much like the Middle East, where new nations like Czechoslovakia and Poland used different tactics in their attempts to construct a homogeneous identity in which you weren't a Mazovian, you were a Pole. All right, yeah, so uh, let's look at the Allies. Uh, first up, France. So France, uh, you know, cheese, Eiffel Tower. Well, it wasn't so romantic in France after the war. France had lost 1.4 million men on the front, and an additional... 6.5 men were wounded. 1.4 million people is an incredible percent of the French population at this time, especially the population of young, able-bodied men. Just for, for comparison, the French population in uh, 1914 was only 40 million. In fact, uh, France had a pretty wild gender imbalance for a while because of this. Uh, the generation that went off to fight in the war those people, there were 1,200 women for every 1,000 men. Good God. And that might explain a little bit about, you know, modern French society. 
And I, I know that also, in addition to all the people who were killed and wounded, many others were just horribly disfigured. And there were more than a million people known as mutilés, you know, for their terrible injuries, which they carried for the rest of their lives. Yeah, like amputations, uh, t- terrible scars on their face, just not having your face at all. It was terrible. And this was the reality of life in pretty much any major post-war European city, where you're just going to see tons of these people on, on the streets begging because... Like, first they've been mangled by this war, and now they just don't have any means to feed themselves. I think in in, a general sense, you know, the entire French nation was mangled by this, because it was France where World War I was primarily fought. Not Britain, not Germany, certainly not the United States, which meant that at the end of the war, France was completely ravaged, you know, large chunks of industry and farmland were destroyed, there are many parts of France that are still uninhabitable today due to the amount of toxic chemicals and, you know, munitions wrought upon the French countryside. Because France had so much to rebuild, they quickly became very deep in debt, which was part of why, somewhat notoriously, France demanded pretty severe reparation payments from the new German government after the end of the war. Yeah, as well as the fact that they were just perpetually afraid of the fact that Germany might once again reindustrialize and invade them. Yeah, it's not exactly the safest border. And of course, as the next 20 years would show them, those fears were, again, completely justified. It seems like in history, whenever France is worried that Germany is up to something, it seems like they are. Well, let's go to Britain. You know, so they're safe in their little island, but was all well on that fair isle? Absolutely not, no. I mean, the British Empire was less scathed and lost about a million people across the empire, but... The figure of the of the disabled beggar veteran was really present in culture. And just like in France, a lot of towns lost a ton of their young men, like m- most of them. Yeah, you know, I've, I've heard stories that uh, because of the way that the British military was structured, a lot of times all the young men from a village would join to fight the war together and they'd be placed in the same division. And if that whole division is sent on one suicidal charge into machine gun fire, that means that the entire village is wiped out. We are. This is now completely out of living memory, World War One. I, I mean, but it's unfathomable to think about something like that today. It is not unfathomable, obviously, to a lot of people around the world, but... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's... it's that, that, well, that's the thing. This was just a completely alien world to us, but at the same time, it's still a world that is just within living memory, which is... That's why this period is so interesting. It's so different, yet not that far. But, so, France obviously had a lot of debts in this period. What about Britain? What was their economy like? So their debt exploded because of the war, because, you know, they used a lot of debt to finance the war. And the British national debt grew from uh, 650 million pounds in 1914 to 7.4 billion in 1919, which is pretty insane. And they wouldn't actually pay this off until 2015, which is honestly kind of, I'm surprised they even bothered. And much of that be- debt was owed to the U.S., was uh, owned by the U.S., which, um, uh, these financial ties between the U.S. and the U.K. are very, very important. Yeah, as anybody who's ever watched Downton Abbey would know, the years after World War I were also seen as sort of the final glory days of the British Empire. This was the territorial peak of Britain. The sun never set, you know, from, you know, from Dublin to Bengal to Auckland. The sun would not set on the British Empire in this period. Yeah, no, this was still, this was when Britain could still claim to be the most powerful sea empire. A lot of these territories were really restive, though. Like, it may look like a huge empire in a map, but it certainly was not all under control. Obviously, things happened in Ireland and would continue to happen there. We went over that in our episode with uh, James on the one that shakes the barley. Yeah, and then hundreds of miles from Ireland, you had huge chunks of territory from the former Ottoman Empire being divvied up between Britain and France in the infamous Sykes-Picot Treaty. Very shortly after this annexation, you had simultaneous revolts in Syria and Iraq erupting against colonial overlords. Yeah, and Iraq, you have something that's uh, very interesting, in my opinion, happen. Um, in 1920, um, across the board, across ethnic lines, they revolted against the British for a number of reasons, but they were unhappy with the direction that the British administration was taking, and so consequently, they started to make a mess of it. And that's when our boy Winston Churchill actually proposes something called aerial policing, where in addition to the 100,000 conventional troops that they had sent to put this uprising down, they were also bombing these people uh, with uh, tear gas canisters from the air, as well as conventional munitions. Very uh, grim how quickly these kinds of tactics go from the battlefield over at Rodin to, to the middle of Iraq. 
And, you know, the atrocities against the Iraqi people committed in this period would actually be immortalized in one of the most famous IRA songs, uh, Come Out You Black and Tans, where they, you know, chastise the British for gassing and bombing these defenseless Iraqi civilians. But of course, there were other, uh, it wasn't just Iraq and Ireland. There was uh, one more eye where another major revolt would happen against British authority. Where was that? Well, that's the thing. It wasn't even a revolt. In 1919 in India, you had the Amritsar massacre, where a number of uh, people were out to peacefully protest against the fact that the British had made these promises that they would increase uh, the amount of self-rule that uh, Indians would uh, would get to um, exercise in exchange for their participation in the war. So in a city in Punjab called Amritsar in 1919, you had this protest in uh, in a garden, basically, just people standing there and chanting. And one British general named Dyer, I believe it was, he just was not having it. He, he told his troops to surround the compound and to open fire upon the protesters, barely even giving them a chance to exit the premises in the first place. And as a result of this, like several hundred at least, and possibly over a thousand people were killed. Uh, this was so appalling and caused such a ruckus that that Dyer was even dragged before Parliament to answer for his conduct. Um, I believe they ultimately found him uh, not guilty for whatever reason, but it was a big deal. What I think is the general trend here is that in the immediate aftermath of World War One, you have a very high level of social unrest that is going to be met with pretty severe violence. And especially we'll talk about this as we get to Central Europe and Germany. In many cases, the institutions or the changes brought to society to enact this violence, this kind of counter-revolutionary fervor, isn't going to go away and is going to remain a central tenet of the entire interwar period. Sometimes this violence involved explicit military actors, sometimes involved militias, sometimes it even just involved mobs. If you look at the U.S., for instance, 1919 is often described as the Red Summer due to the fact that incredibly brutal, oftentimes very bloody, race riots shocked the United States. You had violence and essentially massacres in many American cities um, across that summer, most no uh, notably in Chicago, which was tightly connected with the rise of the Ku Klux Klan in the North as uh, various white militias were formed to oppose integration and any kind of rise of a black middle class across the U.S. A couple of years later, the most notorious of these massacres was in Tulsa, where a white mob burned down the entire black side of town, you know, just destroying this local community. But despite all of that, the U.S. was generally seen as the winner of World War I. Casualties were relatively light, only 100,000 dead out of a much larger population, and the U.S. actually expanded its industrial base during this period. And you know all those debts we mentioned in Britain and France? Who do you think was the person issuing the debts? It was Uncle Sam. So yeah, you know, the world's money bags, all that, blah, blah, dollar diplomacy. This leads to the U.S. playing a much more active role in global politics. Although the 1920 election involved Warren G. Harding coming to power on a basis of returning to normalcy, which was basically code for no more foreign intervention, pretty quickly, you know, the U.S. would get back on the old horse and try to get involved in European politics. Yeah, yeah, but what was Harding reacting to exactly? Woodrow Wilson, the idea of, you know, Wilsonian democracy. Social science nerds love this, you know, a lot of uh, liberal academics are obsessed with this guy. I think Wilson was a pretty terrible person, but his ideas certainly had a lasting impact. Specifically, his 14 points plan to end the war and hopefully ensure a lasting peace in Europe. The idea was to have no more secret treaties, much more freedom of navigation and trade, as well as self-determination of colonized powers. Of course, because Wilson was very racist, his idea of self-determination was pretty limited to countries he considered worthy of independence. Famously, he was all for, you know, Polish and Czechoslovak independence, but when Ho Chi Minh, the future leader of Vietnam, came asking for some consideration for Vietnamese independence from France, he was essentially shown the door. The French leader George Clemenceau, upon hearing about uh, Wilson's so-called 14 points, had a very funny quip saying that um, even our holy god only had 10. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's sort of thing. It was, it was a very complicated plan. The Americans totally rejected it. One part we should mention was that the most controversial aspect was the creation of the League of Nations, you know, mostly now seen as the forerunner to the UN. It didn't really have any power, especially because the U.S. wasn't even a member. With Harding's whole return to normalcy, Americans had no interest in being involved in any kind of international diplomacy, really. And there was a fear that if the U.S. was part of this international body, then international actors would be telling the U.S. what to do. I think it's kind of funny because you sort of see the seeds here of a, a specific modern version of American reaction. This idea that this, you know, this fear of a new world order, of global institutions, you know, U.N. blue helmets telling you to drink your corn syrup. I think that all begins right here. Uh, Wilson's ideas of self-determination were quite limited, uh, but nevertheless, the fact that this rhetoric was invoked and the fact that so many colonial subjects had bled and died for uh, their metropoles, it created an atmosphere of, of expectation that, that the status quo would change. And rhetorically, at least, it, it did. Uh, it meant that now imperialism was supposed to have an expiration date, so that once the people under imperial tutelage are learned in the theory and practice of liberal governance, they are to be granted independence. Um, and so in the name of that ideal, there were no more new colonies, rather the territories taken from Germany and the Ottoman Empire were to be mandates. Right. You know, anybody who listened to our uh, the, the Zionism episode we did with Kevin might remember that the land of Israel at this time was known as the British Mandate of Palestine. I mean, so these mandates, basically, they were under the ultimate jurisdiction of the League of Nations in theory, and they were not to be uh, utilized the same way as colonies had in the pursuit of pure profit and things of that nature. It was, again, a matter of educating the locals so that they are ready to take over the reins and I'm going to let their British masters just uh, sail away with a happy smile and a tear rolling down their cheeks. Yeah. As you might expect, the people living in these colonized countries pretty much you know, saw through the bullshit, and this did very little to placate them. And of course, the conduct of the British and the French weren't much better in these mandates than they were in any of their other colonies. Yeah, again, the, the British massacres in Iraq and India were in, these were the mandates, you know. Supposedly, this was a more humane situation than old school colonialism. In practice, it was just as brutal. One other interesting consequence for the U.S. during this period is that for the first time, you start to see America gaining its footing as not just an economic power, but also a cultural power. American cultural exports began spreading across Europe and even parts of Asia and Africa in the 1920s. You know, a really obvious example is jazz, which would almost immediately transform the pop cultures of pretty much the entire world. And as early as 1925, you had a lot of European intellectuals basically bemoaning what they understood as this, you know, homogenization of culture, this kind of global Americanization that we've talked about in other episodes. One of these intellectuals was this pretty fun writer called Steven Zweig, who some of you especially observant listeners might remember from the credits of the Grand Budapest Hotel, because he was a pre-war travel writer whose journals about Western and Central Europe during the pre-war era really encapsulated the kind of, you know, nostalgia for a simpler time before politics was so crazy, back when the world was a little bit more polite and maybe a little more aristocratic. He wrote this essay in 1925 called The Modernization of the World, which I found really interesting because, I mean, it's been almost 100 years and here we are still in the same situation. It only seems to intensify. Everything is becoming more uniform in its outward manifestations. Everything leveled into a uniform cultural schema. The characteristic habits of individual people are being worn away, native dress giving way to uniforms, customs becoming international. Countries seem increasingly to have slipped simultaneously into each other. People's activities and vitality follows a single schema. And then Zweig goes on to give a number of examples of how this disseminates, Dance, fashion, cinema, radio, these are the four horsemen of Zweig's apocalypse. Or more accurately, maybe, the four horsemen of the Ameripocalypse. What is the source of this terrible way threatening to wash all the color, everything particular out of life? Everyone who has ever been there knows. America. The historians of the future will one day mark the page following the Great European War as the beginning of the conquest of Europe by America. Or, more accurately, the conquest is already rippingly underway. And we simply fail to notice it. 
Conquered peoples are always too slow thinkers. This passion for self-dissolution has destroyed every nation. Now it is Europe's turn. World War was the first phase. Americanization is the second. The other major powers of World War I had an even more traumatic reaction. Because if you lived in Russia, Germany, Austria, or the Ottoman Empire, by the end of the war, the country you were born in would no longer exist. So probably most triumphantly at the end of World War I, there was, of course, two Russian revolutions, which first overthrew the Tsar and then established a socialist republic in the former Russian Empire. You know, we, uh, we're going to talk so much about the Soviet Union during this episode, this podcast series. We don't have to talk much about it right now, but it basically established a global center for world revolution. And the Soviets at this time were very sincerely committed to what they understood as a global emancipatory project. And they thought that Moscow would be the center of, a, of this emancipatory movement that would stretch to all corners of the world. They believed that this would lead to revolution in India, Ireland, China. In some ways, they were kind of correct. Except that, of course, a century later, it was clear that very few places on Earth would look much like the old Soviet model at all. However, Russia was not the only place to have a communist revolution. You also had communist revolutions in Germany... Bavaria, and in Hungary, but they had a much less successful revolt. In Germany, simultaneous uprisings by, by sailors and workers led to the collapse of the old German imperial state. The attempted German communist revolution was short-lived. German communists in 1919, led by the famous Rosa Luxemburg, you know, who's beloved to a whole bunch of socialists today, attempted to create a socialist republic that could link up with the project being built in Moscow. But as most of us probably know, this German revolution was unsuccessful. The remnants of the German imperial military were able to constitute themselves into something called the Freikorps, these far-right militias formed by soldiers coming back from the front, which brutally put down the communist insurgency, first in Berlin and then in Bavaria which had actually turned into a short-lived socialist government. Across the border, you had the former empire of Austria-Hungary being split up into new nation-states. And briefly in Hungary, a guy named Bela Kuhn would lead a successful communist revolution. But very shortly after it was founded, the Hungarian communists would befall the same fate as communists in Germany and Bavaria. A mostly Romanian army led by the Hungarian general Miklos Horthy would ride into Budapest and brutally suppress the communist insurgents that had tried to build a worker state. And I think that this failure of revolution in Central Europe is one of the most important pivot points of the interwar period that we're talking about here. Because you have this essentially stillborn communist dream, this idea of a worker's world stretching from the Pacific to the Atlantic. The militias formed to put down these failed communist movements would remain an incredibly important part of Central European politics in the years to follow. The specter of communism would continue to haunt Europe across the interwar period and be used as a justification for some incredibly brutal atrocities by right-wing forces. Really, it's this consequence of failed insurrection and rabid reaction that gives us the fascist movements of the 20s and 30s, and in a sense, gives us World War II. But of course, you know, When we think of fascism now, we immediately go to its most extreme and destructive iteration in Nazi Germany. But there actually was a pretty long fascist history before that. So when Americans think of fascism, we tend to think of Nazi Germany and not, say, fascist Italy or uh, Francoist Spain. We tend to go to the gas chambers and the camps and the swastika and the brown shirts and all of that. And that's understandable because... Nazi Germany was the most powerful self-defined fascist state in history. As much as uh, Mussolini uh, and fascist Italy wanted to be a regional power, Berlin and not Rome would be the driving force of fascism uh, in the years to come. But fascism as a movement did not begin in Germany. I think it's important to look at fascism in a broader context and the different forms of it to actually understand what happened in the interwar era and what happened during the war itself, frankly. A lot of fascist movements begin in this era, Obviously, the NSDAP, the Nazi Party, begins in the interwar era, and, and obviously so do uh, so does the Fascist Party in Italy. But you also get the Ustasha in uh, what is then Yugoslavia. You also get the the Iron Guard in Romania. 
you get these movements popping up all over Europe, sometimes cooperating and sometimes fighting, because there's some really major frictions here, obviously, between different fascist groups. Fascist militias offered really fucked up World War I veterans a chance to basically keep on fighting the war forever. Be that the, the war against communism or against Jews or against whatever local minority they hated, it allowed them to keep on fighting, to get back in the trenches. Right. Yeah. And so in Germany, you have this idea that that they rightfully won the war and that they had been betrayed by the communists and the Jews. So now they had to violently suppress those elements. In Italy, you had a kind of different situation. We didn't really mention Italian participation in World War I yet, but Italy was part of the war effort. They just didn't do too much fighting. And the fighting that they did, they weren't as successful as other military powers. So in Italy, you had this specific interest in proving in the Italians proving themselves as a new dominant military power. In the years during and after the war, there was a lot of energy in Italy of these veterans hoping to fight a new war to create a powerful Italian state that they believed they deserved. One big difference between Italian fascism and German fascism is that German fascism really much more fixated on Jews than Italian fascism was at this point. That would change later on because of the alliance with Germany and uh, Mussolini had the manifesto and race and all that later on. But for the time, but especially early on, there were quite a lot of Italian Jews who were either sympathetic to fascism or became fascists themselves. Right, because this was seen as, fascism in Italy was seen as this kind of a capitalism with teeth, you know, a way to maintain the social order in a way that would supposedly reinvigorate the nation and also keep the communists and the, you know, peasants at bay whenever they demanded higher wages. And so, you know, if, if you're, if you happen to be, you know, very invested in this middle class capitalist society, even if you happen to be Jewish, you might think the fascists have some good ideas. Absolutely. I mean, Mussolini famously had an Itali- uh, a Jewish Italian mistress. It didn't really matter. Yeah, yeah. And, and also, uh, we should mention that in the years before Nazi Germany was understood as the, you know, the dominant fascist power, Italy also had very close relations with another fascist country, who a lot of Americans probably don't realize had an independent fascist period at all, that being Austria. Yes, Austro-fascism. Right. So Austro-fascism was a really different breed from the fascism in Germany, because it was both not explicitly racialized, and probably most importantly, not even explicitly German. It was much more Catholic also. Right, because Austro-fascism was based on the understanding of Austria as a Catholic, multi-ethnic state in the model of the Habsburg Empire. They also wanted to reclaim lost territories, but they didn't desire the kind of uh, racial purity pursued so brutally by the Nazis. Interestingly, to an even higher degree than in Italy, you had some Jewish participation in fascist Austria prior to Austria's, you know, takeover by Germany and the, of course, complete destruction of Jewish life in that country. But uh, I think it's, it's a very interesting kind of little sidebar here that fascism took many different forms in many different ways. It was always brutal. It always led to people being suppressed because they didn't fit this image of the imagined national community. But the groups of people who were allowed to belong in this imagined community differed really greatly from place to place. And in addition to who was allowed to live in that country, on the flip side to that, the groups that were seen as the most offensive to the national community also really strongly diverged from country to country. Yeah, it did vary. There was t- there tended to be a lot of anti-Semitism all around to varying degrees, and pretty much, I think in every fascist movement, anti-Roma sentiment. Yes, yeah, anti ziganism yeah, yeah. Um, That's kind of a given in right-wing European politics more generally. Yeah, but yeah, but different different heroes in these fascist myths and different different villains too. Yeah, like the Ustasha in Croatia were a lot more focused on uh, killing local Serbs. Yeah, and yeah, let's uh, yeah, and, you know, let's let's talk about the Ustasha now. So, um, if anyone's not familiar, the Ustasha were these fervent Catholic extremists led by a guy named Ante Pavlik in Croatia who wanted to carve out this greater Croatia free from what they imagined as Serbian, Russian, and Jewish influences over their country. Yeah, they functioned as basically a terrorist. Uh, I, I don't usually love to use that term, but you know what I mean. Uh, you know, they did assassinations, bombings, etc. The, the Ustasha existed in 
what was then Yugoslavia, the kingdom of Yugoslavia, before Germans in the Axis more broadly fully invaded the country, which would happen a little later. And when they invaded, obviously, they carved it up. You get the independent state of Croatia, uh, ruled by the Ustasha, ruling this really brutal, brutal fascist regime. Right. But they always, they really, they styled themselves after the Nazis. Yeah, after the Nazis and the Italian, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. What I think is kind of funny about the Ustasha is that Serbs and Croats speak the same language. For an outsider, to be brutally honest, Serbs and Croats are not distinguishable. However, because Serbs are traditionally Orthodox, not Catholic, there was a long history of resentment, and the Ustasha insisted that Serbs were incompatible with any Croatian state. I think a good illustration of the way that mythology and basically fiction influences these very violent ideologies during this period is the fact that, again, Croats and Serbs, not readily distinguishable if you are neither Croat nor Serbian, yet the Ustasha believed they were sworn eternal enemies who could not live together. As part of their Nazi-inspired racial mythology, the Ustasha insisted that Croats were actually the descendants of ancient Goths, even though they spoke a Slavic language, and the Serbs, who spoke an almost identical Slavic language, were instead descendants of Hungarian and Romanian invaders who sneakily adopted the Croatian language to subvert their society. So in the Ustasha worldview, this meant that as these Germanic, as a Germanic Gothic people, Croatia should be part of the Western German Catholic orbit, whereas Serbia should be eliminated. Yeah, it's just insane. There was kind of an idea of a, trying to have a fascist international, much like the communist international, but for an evil cause instead of a good one. Um, but it didn't really work that well because there are some really huge, huge uh, areas of contention here around especially borders, but also ideology, but especially borders. I mean, f- for example, the Ustasha and the uh, Italian fascists both claimed areas of the coast and uh, Dalmatia. And obviously, the Hungarians and Romanians both had competing claims over northern Transylvania, which the Hungarians just uh, ate uh, during the war later on. But well, yeah, let's uh, let's talk about Romania because um, Romania. Not everyone might realize that Romania was itself part of the Axis, right alongside you know Italy and Germany, and it also briefly hosted really one of the most brutal fascist movements of the interwar period, which was the Romanian Iron Guard. Yeah, and uh, this one actually has the distinction of having many of its members integrated into the post-war Communist Party, which didn't really happen that much anywhere else. <laughs> not a not a great look for uh, the Romanian communists, I gotta say. Yeah, and uh, really, I have nothing against the people of Romania, but they seem to have had pound for pound one of the most brutal communist governments and one of the most brutal fascist movements, and apparently some of the same people running the show. So maybe that's not a coincidence. And they didn't exactly step aside after uh, 1989. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. Well, so let, let's start. So uh, the Iron Guard or the Iron Legion was the fascist movement in Romania. It wasn't as successful as a lot of fascist movements, maybe because their leader was actually killed by the Romanian government pretty early. But he was a pretty strange guy. Uh, his name was Nicholas Codreanu, and he was mostly well-known in America because he looked identical to the actor Tyrone Power, which is kind of funny. Wait, so, like, he was well-known in America for looking like an actor? Or or, or, not, or really more like uh, there would have been a, a third-page New York Times article, fascist, you know, uprising in Romania, and they might have mentioned that, like, uh, observers have noted that he looks quite a lot like the leading man, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. He had that Hollywood jaw. Uh, imagine if, like, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi happened to look identical to Tom Cruise. That's Nicholas Kodrianu. Yeah. So, yeah, again, he would end up being executed by the Romanian state. But in his brief tenure as a fascist leader, he would really be one of the just most vampiric individuals in really recorded history. Just an unbelievably brutal fascist leader. His movement was particularly flamboyant, even by fascist standards. They wrapped themselves in traditional aesthetics and spiritualism to give their movement more credence. Like, for instance, they would all wear the traditional costumes of Romanian shepherds, and they would even wear bags around their necks filled with Romanian soil. But really on the ground, they were thugs who killed people, primarily Jewish people, in some of the most brutal ways possible that we're not even going to get into here. The background of the legionaries sort of are typical of individual fascists in this period, because although they dressed like peasants, they weren't peasants. They were mostly 
college kids and recent graduates who couldn't find work in the early 30s, probably due to the Great Depression, which had pretty much global implications, and they blamed their lack of personal professional success on Jews and Hungarians and communists and Russians, who they wanted to completely remove from Romanian society. Their actions were so brutal that the legionaries themselves basically understood that they were going to hell, which is something that I've really never seen in any other fascist movement or really anywhere else in world politics. But they believed they had to do it. Yeah, yes. The idea that you were doing something so evil, it's going to damn you eternally, but it's okay because it's for the good of the Romanian nation. You know, it's kind of it's pretty spooky. Uh, it might just be them trying to spook their enemies by saying this, but it definitely suggests this suicidal commitment to this horribly murderous ethno-nationalist cause. After Kodrianu's death, there would be this major riot in Bucharest where members of the Iron Guard would kill hundreds of Jewish civilians. And most infamously, they would commandeer a local butcher shop where they would torture people to death. Um, one thing also I just want to mention here is that uh, what's so crazy about the degree of extremism you saw in Romanian nationalism in this period is that Romania was a relatively new country. Maybe they felt like they had something to prove, but not that many people would have been Romanian nationalists or even considered themselves Romanian more than a few decades before Kodrianu was around. And Kodrianu himself, we should probably note here, was born to parents with the last names Zelensky and Brunner. In other words, he was a Romanian nationalist with Ukrainian and German ancestry. I don't know if he was insecure or what, but I think this kind of shows that nationalism is always rooted in some kind of fiction. You always want to imagine this ideal of the perfect Romanian national subject, and you will seek to murder, oftentimes, people who don't fit that mold, even if you and your friends might not fit that mold either. You know, it's, just, it's, it's the pursuit of a national perfection that cannot exist. And speaking of new nations, let's go to Poland, which was having quite a time. Right, yeah. So Poland, I guess, had a more, maybe a more illustrious recorded history than the Romanians, but for about... 200 years, there was no Polish state. It had been divvied up between Germany, Austria, and most prominently Russia. But in 1918, with the collapse of the Russian Tsardom, you have a new Polish nation immediately being created. And what's the first thing the new Polish government does once they find their independence? Well, they, uh, they invade the Soviet Union. <laughs> then they occupy what's now Belarus, Ukraine, and Lithuania, hoping to recreate the polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, basically recreate their borders from several centuries before. Right, right. Because before this partition of Poland in the late 18th century, the polish Lithuanian Commonwealth had been a really major state in Eastern Europe. A lot of Poles wanted to recreate that kind of past legacy. So basically, the Poles were successfully pushed out of these territories by the Red Army, and basically they had signed this treaty. Frankly, by that point, everyone was worn out and was looking towards the end of war. So uh, so they signed the treaty in, in Riga, I believe, in 21. And so the territories which the Poles had occupied uh, would become a part of the, of the Soviet Union, but, but Poland itself would remain independent. Right. And so today, this Polish-Soviet war, it's not really believed to have had a clear winner, but a lot of Polish people celebrated as this big victory against their much larger neighbor. But with the war over, it was pretty clear that Poland wasn't going to be, you know, reclaiming its vast Eastern European empire anytime soon. So this led to this pretty interesting question among Polish nationalists, which was, should we look like the Piast kingdom or the Jagiellonian kingdom? No, 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 hold on. No, no, yeah, I, know, I know our listeners are probably confused here. You know, Piast, Jagiellonian... Uh, what's going on here? Well, this is in what they purport to be a language that they call Polish. Yeah, but basically, you uh, these are two competing visions of what this new Poland should be. Will it be Western, uh, homogenous, and Catholic, or will it be Eastern, heterogeneous, and more religiously pluralistic? Right, because yeah, so the while the you know the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, which was ruled by the Jagiellonian dynasty, was somewhat you know was very diverse and had a lot of sort of liberal rights and privileges. The previous Piast dynasty was much smaller and supposedly more homogeneously Polish and Catholic. 
this dispute between you know the the Piast and Jagiellonian vision would really tear the country apart. And for a while, the Piast side was winning, with the Jagiellonian side mostly being represented by Pilsudski, this military hero who was sort of seen as the savior of Poland in that period. Um, with the end of World War I, actually, the Paris Peace Conference specifically mandated that Poland had to be a pluralistic country, the kind of country Pilsudski wanted, where there would be equal rights to Jews, Ukrainians, and Germans. But a lot of Poles didn't want that, and they wanted specifically a Polish nation for ethnic Polish people. Exactly. Yeah, you had a lot of right-wing Polish politicians who were trying to forcibly assimilate ethnic minorities into the Polish society. And not surprisingly, you get some hardcore anti-Semitism. Uh, to be honest, I, I think it's fine to say here that in the early 20s, Poland came a lot closer to fascism than a lot of us might expect. And I think that a Polish fascism probably would have looked a lot more like Germany than Austria in the level of anti-Semitism that would have existed there. I will read a quote from the uh, Minister of Education, uh, Stanislaw Grabski. Poland may be preserved only as a state of Polish people. If it were a state of Poles, Jews, Germans, Russians, Belarusians, Lithuanians, Russians, it would lose its independence again. Yeah, this is immediate distrust of any potential fifth colonists, any ethnic minorities who might betray the Polish state for its enemies. This was an incredibly popular concept during this time. The Nazis would, of course, associate Jewish people with communists and use this as a pretense to massacre Jews all across Eastern Europe. And even the Soviets, they would be pretty suspicious of Germans and Muslims living in the Soviet Union, with some um, unfortunate deportations sometimes being done to alleviate that. But really, Poland is where you see one of the most aggressive campaigns of ethnic homogenization that wouldn't be ended until Pilsudski, the you know pluralistic champion, would basically abolish the democratic Polish government and institute a military dictatorship that also happened to guarantee rights for minorities. The only parallel I can think of is the uh, the ethnic cleansings of uh, Anatolia and the Turkish Greek uh, population exchange, if you want to call it that. Yeah, yeah, that that's that's sort of what was going on in Central Europe at this time. And so I, what I think is interesting is that although uh, Pilsudski's vision ultimately won out over the more extreme Piast platform, eventually Poland slowly did become a very Catholic, you know, and a uh, very Polish country. Obviously, in the Holocaust, the vast majority of the Jewish population would be destroyed and the survivors would primarily leave the country. But you also saw uh, eventually many of the heavily Ukrainian territories would become part of the modern Ukrainian nation. And you also had many people slowly converting from, U from Ukraine Orthodox to Catholic, just as they, that the Piast party wanted. And something I think is kind of funny is that although they're not really relevant to Polish politics, there actually is still a party simply calling itself the Piast party in modern day Poland. So these ideas quite literally have never gone away. Poland is awesome. Yeah, and today Poland is 97.7% ethnic Polish, apparently. Yeah, so they, yeah, in a, in a really awful way, the uh, ethno-nationalists succeeded, you know, and uh, maybe because the Poles had the good luck to be on the wrong side of the Germans, none of their ethnic cleansers suffered any consequences. And uh, I'm sure many of the people involved in the Polish state in the 20s were also involved in the communist Polish state after the war, just like in, as we discussed in Romania. So that's a broad overview of what Europe and the United States looked like right at the dawn of the interwar period. Obviously, Europe and the United States are only a small part of the world. So in this series, we're going to talk about a lot of other countries in the near future. Um, we're hoping to get very deep into the politics of the countries we've just described, as well as talking about what was going on in Japan and Spain and Turkey during this period, both countries that would end up fighting in World War II and those that would sit the conflict out for various reasons. But again, one cool thing about this podcast series is that unlike the episodes we've done on ancient Rome or the early Middle Ages, this is an era where we have a huge amount of recorded audio and video that can help us understand these topics. So because of that, we want to get really hard into the art that was produced during this period, as well as maybe diving into some art about this period, you know, the kind of classic movie episodes that we like doing. There was a huge transformation culturally in Europe and the world at large during these eras. We already talked about the way that jazz spread across the world and American culture, which spread across Europe. But in more of the realm of high art, 
you had a lot of developments within Europe that have very interesting ramifications on modern and contemporary art. Modernism, which we could maybe do a whole episode on, was this enormous artistic and intellectual movement starting before the war, which basically reached its height in the years after World War I. We talked in our Nosferatu episode about German Expressionism and the competing movement of new objectivity, both which sought to present an unflinchingly brutal vision of the world, basically uh, inspired by the traumas of World War I. Musically, there was the emergence of a new, of a completely new style of music known as 12-tone surrealism that was believed to supersede the traditional, the um, uh, classical tradition of Mozart and Mahler with a completely new vision of harmony and melody. This idea that a melody should not be constructed out of a single key, like most melodies were in music, but instead should mathematically be constructed to not be in any key at once. All of these, you know, new movements in Germany are very strongly associated with the short-lived Weimar state, but uh, as a lot of you guys might already know, German modernist movements were completely suppressed in the Nazi era, and that as soon as the Weimar Republic ended, really any hope for independent artistic expression in Germany would be gone. Instead, you had this sort of anti-modernist reaction taking place. You had romantic nationalism replacing a more, you know, cynical uh, or skeptical objectivism. And you had movements like, you know, various types of spiritualism and mysticism, which often but not always overlapped with fascist support being popular in Europe. A big part of why the Nazis appropriated the Hindu swastika was because a lot of Nazis had a strange inf- interest in uh, Buddhism and Hinduism that had been brewing in German intellectual circles for a while. Uh, the Nazis themselves produced some art in this period, but it was incredibly, obviously incredibly political, hoping to you know show the power of the German state. But it was also very anti-modernist in general. Probably the only piece of Nazi art that anybody knows, which I bet... I bet you two guys don't realize is Nazi art is the Carmina Burana by Karl Orff. You know, it's used in every uh, action movie commercial, but that famous choral piece was produced in Nazi Germany sort of as a reaction to the supposedly degenerate music of people like Arnold Schoenberg and Alban Berg. But uh, not everywhere would fascism be associated with this kind of staunch anti-modernism because as we talked about, Italian fascism was always very different in its outlook from German fascism, and art is one of the best examples of this. Because Italy actually, in the years leading up to and during World War I and the eventual fascist takeover, was a really vibrant community for artistic modernism. But what's so different from Italy versus Germany in this period is that in Italy, many of the modernist artists would themselves become fascists. A group known as the Futurists put out something called the Futurist Manifesto right shortly before the emergence of the fascist party in Italy and had a a lot of shared interests. They produced a style of modernist art that basically rejected everything organic, instead embracing the hard edges and bold shapes of capitalist modernity. It's the triumph of man over nature, the soldier over the civilian, the man over the woman, you know, very closely connected with fascist ideals about dominance and masculinity. I think what's also very interesting about mo- about futurism in Italy is that it was explicitly pro-war and pro-violence, which I think really connects to the idea that Italians fought in World War I, but they didn't finish the fight. Whereas in Germany, you had a complete opposite view of war, where the German modernists, the, you know, the, the objectivists and the expressionists basically saw war as everything wrong with modern society that they wanted to reject. And that uh, I just think it's very interesting that, you know, these two modernist movements would have exact opposite reactions to the war. We should should mention, though, that uh, this was not the only artistic movement in Italy during this time. And that unlike Germany, Italy actually did have a pretty vibrant artistic scene in its fascist era. Eventually, the futurists would be sidelined, you know, which maybe should be expected as they were modernist artists after all. And instead, the Italians had this idea of a... uh, the movement they just called 20th century, which was the official state art of Italian fascism, which harkened back towards the Renaissance and ancient Rome. You know, these societies that supposedly display the innate superiority of the Italian nation. 
But yeah, but you know, the uh, the, the Novi Senso movement, the 20th century movement versus the futurists are a really interesting way of how fascism can take a lot of different forms. And I think that, you know, there's so much political discussion these days about what fascism means. I think the best way to look at this is to look at the peoples who called themselves fascists. Look at what they had in common and what they didn't, you know. I think that uh, comparing the kind of the more dour traditionalist 20th century people versus the, the kind of brash uh, futurists, it's, it's really interesting the way that like these two different fascist expressions. All this is to say... There's so much we want to get into with this podcast series, and we're really excited to talk about the interwar period. So many characters with such crazy lives in this period. And really, again, this was a period that transformed every part of the world. And we really hope to talk about all parts of the world in this series. So much discussion of World War II centers around the U.S., Europe, maybe a little bit in Japan, but we want to really go beyond those borders and talk about the broader global transformations in the 20s and 30s. I hope this episode gave sort of a little taste about the kind of concepts we're going to be dealing with in this broader series. So much of what we discussed will be expanded on later. We have plans to bring on guests who actually have really professionally studied these topics, so we're not just totally talking out of our asses here. And like I said, we want to go all over the world, particularly places like Turkey, Japan, and Spain, who had a very interesting experience in the 20s and 30s. And I know that this is a topic that a lot of our audience is really excited about. So much about the 20s and 30s are relevant now, and so much of these topics are often discussed today. So anybody listening, if you have any particular interest in a moment in history, or a certain person, or a political party, or an idea that was prominent in the interwar period... Let us know, because we would love to get to that as we fill out the series. Or if you'd just like to come on the podcast and talk about it, then please reach out. Yeah, yeah. You know, Gladiator for Europe, we are always looking for new guests. So if you know something about this period that you'd like to share, DM me, DM one of the Sams. Our DMs are open. And yeah, we'd love to talk to you guys. Yeah, just slide into my DMs. No dick pics, please. Well, this has been Gladiator for Europe. Like I said, we are... uh, about to start a really ambitious new project, and we hope you guys have as much fun with it as we did. Thanks for listening. This has been Gladiator for Europe, signing off.